What Mark and I had originally wanted to go ahead and do, but we didn't find a horse for it. I've shot the, the All American Quarter Horse Congress for 40 years, did the uh, World Championship uh, Quarter Horse Show for about 36 years before my good friend uh, Craig Harrison knocked me out of business. But anyway, uh, I've had the pleasure of going ahead and working with some fantastic people and fantastic horses. I've uh, been handed a lot of uh, uh, wrecks, so to speak, uh, straight up front, which is what, one of the things that you get in the show horse shoer. And uh, what we were wanting to cover today and hoping that we could find, uh, you'll find a lot of people that shoot for uh, alder horse people that have a tendency to uh, have trainers that try to tell them how to shoe the horses and set their feet up and so on and so forth. And one of the primary goals that they all seem to want in any kind of a uh, horse that's going to be used for halter or uh, showmanship and those types of things, they want horses to go ahead and stand straight. And unfortunately, when you go to the horse shows, you see people trying to create straightness through going ahead and create crookedness. And by that I mean, if we got a horse that's out in his knees and we try to go ahead and make him a, a straight horse, now we've turned around and taken a horse that usually wants to break over on the inside of his foot, we turn around and tow him in, and now we got a horse that breaks over the outside of his foot, and all horses that uh, have a tendency to be towed in horses have a tendency to move how? Paddle paddle to the ground. The more they're in, the more the paddle. If you watch uh, the old Gunsmoke movies and stuff like that, that old buckskin horse that uh, Matt Dillon rode just, I mean he was a, uh, he did charge your teeth out if you had to ride him as many miles as that guy rode him. But anyway, why don't we turn around and take those horses and we get them to where they're like this and they're that way because of their knee. Our knees are like our fingers on a horse, they only go this way. If they're out here, they gotta go this way and so on and so forth. So when you turn this thing around here that's supposed to be here, we start creating a horse that wants to go to the outside of his leg and then he turns around and shoots back through and lands real heavy on the outside of his foot. The reason that he does that is this leg is trying to go ahead and catch up with the other leg and when it gets this far, that knee locks up and does not allow that foot to go ahead and continue in a uh, flight path like a towed-in horse does. It has to go this far, it locks up, the knee says, no thank you, and then it has to swing back through. We get horses that go ahead and uh, that have been overcorrected that way, and it ends up to where those horses, a lot of times, will bang their ankles, they'll bang their knees, and so on and so forth. So anyway, what we were hoping that we were going to get today is we were hoping that we were going to get one of those horses and we are going to show you that when you've got those feet that are out of balance that way to where we've got more toe to the medial side of the foot and you go ahead and put that horse back up to where he is comfortable and the break over is to the inside of his foot instead of the outside of the foot, nine times out of ten, that changes that flight path and it also changes that movement that comes out like this, comes in and has a tendency to land heavy on the outside. The horse that we ended up getting does not have that movement. Although he is a high-low horse, his foot is high on the uh, right side and low on the left side. This horse, his shoulder is more developed on his left side than it is on his right side, which is that way because he's compensating for his movement. Now if you move this horse, and I think some of you came outside, maybe not all of you, came out, when you go ahead and move this horse in this circle to the left, he's not that heavy. When you move him to the right, he's really jamming quite a bit. This horse has got length, he does not have depth. So to go ahead and buy that, I mean, you look at his foot and you say, well, it's out here and he's, he's got a lot of foot. You go to attack with too much of this foot on the bottom, this horse is going to end up turning around and saying, I'm not that happy. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and pretty much shape his feet up and go ahead and get his feet to where they've got a little bit more balance than they got and then we're going to move him we're going to see what we've got. Now in the quarter horse world that I've had to deal with for the last uh, 50 years and I've been shoeing horses for 50 years uh, the lifestyle of all of it has changed. We used to do a lot of steel shoes in front. We used to make a lot of handmade shoes before shoes uh, became uh, as, as good and as available as they are today. Over the last 25 to 30 years, for most people in the quarter horse business, with the exception of the hauler horse business, and even some of the hauler horse people, want aluminum shoes on the front. They want aluminum shoes on there for several different reasons. They think it's because it's light, and the horses move better in light shoes. Well, it isn't because of the light, it's because the aluminum is a softer material and goes ahead and has better traction with the ground than your steel shoe. Your steel shoe has a tendency to have a little bit more slide to it. People that show in, in the English classes, the Western classes today, not necessarily in the, uh, in the reining or the cow horse classes, those kind of things, they're still pretty much in the steel shoes. But our other events, our other disciplines, they like the aluminum shoes because they think they look pretty and they think that, uh, that they're light and the horses move better. But it, they move better in them because they have a little bit more traction to the ground. So consequently, over the years I've gone ahead and put on a lot of aluminum shoes. I've gone through a whole different series of aluminum shoes. Today we have outstanding aluminum shoes on the market for all disciplines and these shoes the biggest drawback to them are they're very caustic and by caustic I mean the deterioration on them in some horses and because in the summertime when it's uh, they get a lot of water and so on and so forth so you got a gelding that's keeping the uh, center of the stall real wet and whatnot. At the, period, at the end of about a three week period you start seeing those things oxidize. Next thing you know if you've got a client that doesn't want to shoe their horses every four weeks and they go ahead and uh, have their horses shod let's say every six weeks or stretch it even longer than that you come back you pull a shoe off and you'll find oxidation on those, on those shoes sometimes it will be that thick. Well, we've got a shoe that's nailed on the horse's foot, the bottom of his foot. Where do you think that oxidation has to go? It has to go up into the wall. It has to go up into the white line. It has to go into the sole. I've pulled shoes off of horses that have gone ahead and that has actually gone ahead and forced the hoof ball to go ahead and look like the toe on that, on that uh, foot right there to where it's actually been cracked from it. One of the things that I've changed in my uh, shoeing and approach to horses over the last uh, probably 20, 20 to 25 years is I go ahead and I put a thin leather on them. There for a while I was using what we used to use on the uh, standard bred horses. I was using what they call a, uh, a thin liner, which is a, is a plastic that is a very good pad. But when you get into summertime, and the summertime is uh, a lot of extra water, from the baths, you take a horse to the horse show and he shows in five, four, three, whatever the amount of classes there are, they try to give him a bath before every show. Well, that water takes and goes down his horse's leg, even though they go ahead and do a halfway scrape job on him, the water from here to here all goes down there. And when that shoe is sitting out a little bit full, all that water ends up going between that shoe and that foot, which goes ahead and probably is the worst thing that you can go ahead and have happen to a horse's foot over a period of time, even if he's shod proper. So I've gone ahead and started using what I call a uh, uh, light leather or a thin leather. And what I do, originally I used to go ahead and just rivet it with one rivet in the heel. And over a period of time, and especially if you're using a thicker leather, if you're using a regular leather, you'll find that over three or four weeks to a month, those leathers will start going ahead and popping out because they get the water on them. 
and the horse's expansion and contraction. Next thing you know, you got a piece of leather sticking out there about that wide, and old Sammy goes ahead and comes over here, steps on that thing and pops his pops the heel up or pops the shoe off or he catches it in the trailer. About 15, 15, 16 years ago, I uh, have had the opportunity to be a real close friend of uh, Lee Lyles, and we shot a lot of horses together and whatnot. And I started really studying a lot of these uh, William Russell uh, boards and one thing or another that have uh, pads on them and leathers on them and so on and so forth. And I started looking real close at her old shoes. So you can't, you, if you just walk by and just kind of look at it, you really don't notice it. But I really started studying a lot of those shoes to see how they're made. And a lot of his leathers, he turned around and would have a heel, a, a rivet in a heel. Go up another inch and a half, and there'd be another rivet in there. Go up another three inches, and there'd be a there'd be a uh, rivet in that. I'd say to myself, "Well, I wonder how come he done that." So one day I said to myself, "I'm going to try that." Would go ahead and put two rivets in my heels. Also, I used to go ahead and put my leathers to where the rough side of the leather would be to the foot and not the smooth side. Over time, I have found that the smooth side of the leather actually works better because it goes ahead and doesn't let the horse settle down in there as much when, when the horse is uh, getting all the baths in the summertime. And it also goes ahead and creates like a horse that has clips on his feet. I'm sure a lot of you guys have shot horses with leathers in all disciplines, and you find when you pull a shoe off right there at the heel, You'll have a little, if you take your finger and go around the edge of it, you'll find that it's, it's a little sharp right there. Well, that foot sinks down in there, and that leather will grab that foot just like that, which really goes ahead and on a bad-footed horse, helps hold that foot together, providing you've got a flat shoe on a flat foot. Now, if you don't have a flat shoe on a flat foot, a lot of guys will go ahead and take and uh, dunk them in leather and or dunk them in water so the leather is softer and, 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 and fill the gaps up that way. Uh, it's been brought to my attention through, uh, through old horseshoers that one of the reasons that we uh, went ahead and started shoeing horses with hot shoes is because it takes so much longer for a guy that shoes horses with cold shoes to go ahead and practice and get skillful enough to go ahead and create a flat shoe to a flat foot. And there are a couple of little different practices that I used and have used since I got out of horseshoe in school back in 69 and then learned from other people that go ahead and help me create that situation. Because my eye is not as dependable as it should be and I don't think anybody in here that is eye is totally dependable. And, and if you've got a foot that's uh, neat flat to flat, if you're doing with hot shoes, you can do that. Well, aluminum shoes, they aren't that easy to go ahead and, and burn your feet in. So, anyway, on that mark, uh, Yeah, that video goes. Just center it up on this white line. I think it would be good. So when you're what trimming, the, when you're trimming him, you're not trying to. You're just trying to get all the hairs off. You're not trying to make him land flat. Well, this horse, fortunately, I don't think we can make him land flat. And if we can make him land flat. Right now, for the most part, this horse is walking sound. I'm not going to go ahead and try to create something that's going to go ahead and, and, and think I'm going to make myself a hero and send this horse out of here to where he's lame. And we got a pretty foot, but we got a lame horse. Pretty and lame don't doesn't go together. So what we're going to do, because he doesn't have that much in there, we're just going to clean him up, balance him up, make some fine adjustments in his foot and hope that when we get done, maybe you'll move a little bit better than what we do. And it's our first time to approach this horse. 
when you get a first time to approach this horse, that's when you want to be most cautious. That's when you're learning about this horse. That's when he's talking to you. That's when he's telling you. You know, pay attention to what you're doing and you're going to come out two or three jobs down the road to where now maybe you fix it, maybe you won't. This horse, I would say, probably with that right front foot will probably always, always want to land heavy on that outside a little bit. Folks find it. Now, I'm well, I'm dressing this up. I'm shaping it from the bottom because it's like Terry said, this horse has a lot of length, but it doesn't have any depth. I don't know if you know what I mean by that. What I mean by it is if I take and measure from the coronary band to the end of the toe, that's the length. That's what I was just going to show that. But if I have a straight edge here and go straight down, that's the height. The height affects the position of the bone, if that makes sense. If I trim from the bottom, I'm going to tip the bone down. If I trim the heels, I'm going to tip it back. So I'm just bringing it back. It might affect the height a little bit, but not like it would from trimming it straight to the bottom. Another thing is, if you watch, I'm not going to dress very far up. I'm going to imagine in my mind, if I put a sharpie around there where the coffin bone is. Well, from there up, there shouldn't be any distortion. There should be attachment to the bone. So I'm just going to dress from there down. That makes sense. Plus, you got to remember, if he takes a eighth of an inch off the front of that horse's foot, he's shortened that he's shortened that foot by an eighth of an inch. So if he goes ahead and takes that foot all the way back, takes all that down, he's going to turn around and probably shorten that horse down to where he's, I would say, pretty much close to a uh, three and a quarter inch foot. Let's just. That's right where he's at right now. Now one of the things that I do with my horses, and a lot of guys think I'm anal about that kind of stuff, I measure my feet before and I measure my feet after. I want to know where I started and where I ended up. Most guys don't do that. Some guys do, some guys don't. Yeah, I'll come around. Yes, I do. I'm not sure I can get all the way around either. We can move the horse, maybe. Well, if we can turn it around. Can you guys see this? Right here, this big medial flare. Ask me if I can see that. Can you see that on the uh, medial flare on the uh, screen up there? Yeah. If we were to go ahead and let play a, uh, whoops, a straight line <coughs> down across this foot, we can see that we've got a whole, mu whole lot more material to the uh, inside than we do to the outside. So this is telling us we need to go ahead and remove that. Plus at the same time, we're finding damage going on to the lamini because it's actually stretching the lamini. Well, your white line and your quarter band and your eye actually has to go ahead, has to go ahead and balance it. You know, you have to go ahead and have lines on a horse. When you go ahead and chew horse, you have to have several different lines. You have to have the line that is going to go ahead and, and balance your profile. You also have to have lines when you stand in front of a horse. If you look at the front of this horse, I want myself personally I want this center line of this foot to go ahead and balance with the center line of this knee. This knee is actually what's controlling that lower flight of that limb. That's the last thing that breaks away is that knee. Then I like to go ahead and have the outside of both of my bone structures go ahead and draw two lines down there and pretty much I want that sitting in the center. I don't want it over here, I don't want it over there. I want it to go ahead and be able to look down my knee and see my foot sitting in the, in the center of my knee. Yeah. Oh, that's 
Get as long as you can. That's uh, about as far as I can get right here. Lloyd, uh, you just asked, what am I using for a guideline? I did something with my loop knife to kind of show the interface of where the sole and the lamina come together. I wouldn't do this every day, but it's just something so you guys can see the difference. I've already took a lot of that medial flare off, and you'll be able to see. What I'm following is, is the interface where the sole and the lamina come together, because the lamina can stretch after that. So this line right here is the shape. You guys see that? Yes. Okay. So that's what I, my guide is. That, and you can see, you know, the fact that it was stretched a while ago. When you raise this up and you sight down the knee, you should be able to see a silhouette of the foot. And you can that see that matches the silhouette of your coronary band. Yeah, and you can see this. Is a little bit better than your flat. And these flares and, and feet that get that far off, it took them a while to get that way. So it's going to take you, don't go ahead and take, you can always do it all at one time. Go ahead and take a little bit of time to do it. You know, set yourself up for success the next time. We have two choices in life. In everything that you do in life, you can either set yourself up for success or you can set yourself up for failure. And if you want to set yourself up for failure, go ahead and do a little bit extra. Nine times out of ten, that's usually what will get you. Just from taking the flare off the inside of that horse right now and looking at that foot, that foot looks a whole lot different and a whole lot more balanced than what it did before. What that look like it landed like? A lot flatter. Imagine that. We didn't tilt this horse's foot. We didn't do anything with this horse's foot. We just put it more in balance. Symmetry. We put the symmetry back into this horse's foot, and now all of a sudden this horse goes ahead and starts saying, hey, now my breakover is a little bit more where I'm happier with it. Anybody got any questions? Anybody want to come up here and look at anything? Or are uh, you all satisfied? That's what we're here for. If we can, uh, if we can give you any uh, any benefit at all, we'd love to do it. Uh, another thing, uh, the reason I'm pressing this foot, the reason I'm pressing this foot back uh, from the top first is, like I said, it has length, but it doesn't have a lot of height, or if you want to call it depth doesn't have a lot of sole depth. So there's not any reason to, you know, to, to take it from the bottom. Um, so I'm going to take it, I'm going to dress it from the front because this, especially this right front, the heels need to come down some. If I bring the heels down and then I dress the front of the foot off, as possible I could have two planes. Because as you dress the front back, like I said, you are going to lose a little bit of height. So I'm going to dress the flare off the front, then Dress the foot back. Does that make sense? So I don't want to get myself in a pickle, you know. He's just he's he's got him a safety vent that goes ahead and sets him up for success instead of going ahead and setting himself up for failure. You know, there's so many times when you're shoeing horse shows, and of course I didn't go to horse shows just to shoe horses in a horse show. I had a series of clients that went ahead and was on the circuit all the while, so I had horses that were due those particular weeks that those horse shows were going on, so that put me in a horse show to go ahead and do those clients, and at the same time I ended up with doing other businesses, so on and so forth. Of course, I had a really big core horse venue that uh, that demanded my attention so it was kind of one of those things that uh, 
when my good horses were at the horse show, it was important to me to go ahead and be able to cover those bases. Now, when we evaluated this horse out in the outside, we put a T-square on him and one thing or another. And when you first picked up that horse's foot, it, it looked like the horse was high on the inside. Now that you've gone, we've gone ahead and, and taken that medial uh, toe quarter off of there, that horse does not have that appearance anymore. And I think as horseshoers, one of the things that we all need to go ahead and pay attention to with ourselves is our own shortcomings. Myself, my right front foot is the hardest foot for me to go ahead and do. I have a tendency to go ahead and maybe leave my outside toes longer. Usually I'll go ahead and trim a right front foot and I always leave me some there. I don't go ahead and go, to, go through the whole foot. I'll come back over here and go to my uh, left front foot. And once I've got my left front foot done, then on nine times out of ten, I'll always end up going back over there and rechecking my toes. Because for some reason, with me, and it's only me, my outside toe all of a sudden now appears longer to me, and I'll pick it up right here. So if you find yourself to where you, uh, you recognize these little things that you do, go ahead and have some kind of checks and balance system for yourself that's going to go ahead and, uh, like I say, set yourself up for success. One of the other things that I find a lot of times I find a lot of times, and I don't find it with this man here. He has an outstanding ability to go ahead and balance his foot and put his, or his frog, and put his frog in the middle of his foot. His knife strokes are the same on his medial side as they are on his lateral side, which a lot of times you'll walk by and, hey, we're all out there doing it to make a living. Sometimes we got seven horses due today. Sometimes we got three horses due today. Those days you only got three horses to do, you take a little bit more time to do a little bit nicer job. Today you got more horses to do, maybe the humble a few of them. And you start getting tired. And you have a tendency, well, you draw your knife up one side, it's a little bit heavy. You draw your knife up the other side, it's not done the same plan. You do that three or four times in a row with the horse's feet, the next thing you know you just walk around that foot. How come that horse is always, foot is always leaning this way? And a lot of times if you pay attention to your frog, and, and, and the frog is moving over here, moving over there, or even, even with the length of it. If the length of it has a tendency to where the apex of the frog is moving to the front of your foot, it's getting longer and longer and longer, the next thing you know you'll pay attention and your foot is getting longer and longer and longer. So if you pay attention to some of those little details, the smaller details, you'll all of a sudden find that uh, your shoe will become one day a little bit better. Or you'll become more happy with it. Your horses are going better and so on and so forth. Go look at them, Terry. Bottom. Or if you want any more heel or what do you want me to do? If we look at these heels on this horse, we can see that this horse has really been taking a little bit extra extra pressure on top of his on, on his heels. We've got some bruising going on there. So that tells us that our high heel wasn't as happy as what it appeared before we uh, cleaned that off. I have used the protractor for 50 years. They taught me how to use it in school. I had a junkie when I started off with school. I turned around and uh, got hooked up with uh, two different people 
over the years uh, did an apprentice with a uh, worked with a fellow by the name of Bill Brown for about four years. I worked with George Fitzgerald. Uh, some of you may be familiar with him, some of them might not. George was probably one of my greatest mentors. Taught me a tremendous amount of stuff. I started off as a uh, director for the Connecticut Horseshoers Association in 1971. Did that until the 80s. But anyway, we had to pass a test through uh, George Fitzgerald and the Chris brothers back in that day, and that was using the uh, Army manual as a, uh, as a uh, uh, textbook. But one of the things that I've found that helps me, especially in the cold shoe, and I don't, I don't have to deal with it when I shoe hot, but I can take this protractor right here, this part here, that don't mean nothing. This part right here being flat all the time, very, very important for me. I can take this protractor, I can put it on the bottom of this foot, and as you can see, it's got shiny spots on it. It's got shiny spots on it because all that rough stuff has actually been worn off from my fingers over 50 years. I can lay that on here, and I can find my highs and my lows. You see that protractor? I can take that protractor and I can look down through there and I can see the daylight parts of it that tells me maybe I need to go back and take one more stroke of the rasp right here. <laughs> well, you didn't tell them this medial tone was gone on this one. Right here. I didn't? No, it's gone. It's... Well, you didn't take it off, did you? No, it's not been touched. <laughs> Let's hear deal. I think it's not enough for you. It's gone right here, yeah, so it's going to fall off. You want to take some more off the toe? Alright. Feet off, don't get crazy. <laughs> we got enough, we'll be, we'll be in good shape. Hey Terry, uh, if you do aluminum most of the time, pardon? You see, if you do aluminum most of the time, you said you can't burn it. You ever just have a plate? I think you have. Why would I want to do that when I can do this? You know, I did a clinic here. Oh, I don't know, a couple of years ago, up there for Amble Brain, and I set my uh, front feet up and got to my hind feet. A horse had a real nice hind foot. I went over the anvil, I shaved the steel shoe. I turned around, walked back over to the horse. It fits like a glove. There's no no daylight, no nothing, no rock, no ballast. And a young boy says to me, he says, Are you going to burn it in? <laughs> Hell, I hadn't even started with Ford. Why would I go ahead? I'm in, I'm in this business to go ahead and do the same thing you guys are to make money. If I got to go ahead and take the extra time to burn it in just to find out that I already knew my shoe was flat, and my foot was flat, I'm just wasting time. I've got other horses to do after that, so you know it really it really isn't necessary. I mean, if you like the smoke and the fire, go ahead and uh, and uh, have your customer go ahead and be happy. I guess that's all right, but I don't think it's really that necessary. I think it's all by the checks and balances systems that you set up for yourself to go ahead and create the right thing. Now we all know that if we got flat to flat and then we got flat landing on the ground, those shoes are going to be a lot better for a lot longer period of time than if they aren't. So that's really what we're trying to create. We're trying to create solid. Now when we go ahead and we put that leather between this, because we're using, uh, using uh, aluminum, now we've all, all of a sudden taken that oxidation that can be present. It isn't always present in every foot. I shoe every foot that way because I don't want to have to come back and deal with it at a later date. 
it's easier for me to go ahead and take the extra time, put it on, and have my customers happy. Half the time they're on this stuff at horse shows, the next time they're, they're on different terrain all the while, and it's just a protection. It's like uh, going ahead and getting an insurance policy. And you'll find that if you do that, over a period of time, your feet will get so solid you won't believe it. And there's only two things that I have in my mind to go ahead and try to uh, try to go ahead and uh, have good horses. I'm doing one of two things to go ahead my horse's feet. I'm either trying to loosen them up or I'm trying to tighten them up. Y'all understand what I'm saying by that, right? Our lower feet, we're usually trying to tighten up. Our higher feet, we're trying to loosen up. better on your right, Mark. I guess your left is your problem. <laughs> Just funny, you know. This Mark Mills is probably one of the best horseshoers, and I've seen a lot of horses, one of the best horseshoers. I've ever had the experience to go ahead and be around. He's a, a fantastic individual and just a fantastic horseshoer. He can do stuff with a horseshoe that very few can. Oh, it'll come. They said it brought you to get ahead of that easy for you, I know. Does anybody have any questions while we're uh, here watching Mark do this? Do you have a preference in nails? Yeah, I do. I use basically three different nails. I use a uh, Cape Well four and a half extra long on my front feet. Sometimes I go ahead and I use a, uh, I, a, a slim blade. And I use a uh, five slim blade Cape Well behind on most all my shoes. Every now and then, if I'm doing a rainer or something like that, I'll use a, uh, I'll use a five plate special, which was the original development for uh, rain and horse feet and actually quarter inch steel is what it was designed for. Whereas if you use a city head nail in quarter inch steel, we have a gap where when you get half worn out with that, your shoes will start loosening upwards uh, with that being a uh, very tapered uh, head on there and, and shank. You can wear them things down to where they're done, darn near like uh, paper, you know, pretty thin. But you need to go to bed tonight, man. You're tired. <laughs> Brown Warren wanted to make that. <laughs> Love it. You want to, um, Got any questions while he's gone?
back. I was going to talk about it. You talk about it. I used to, uh, and lots of, I mean, I'm sure there's some people in here. If you ever went to the World Show, I'd go up there, I shot some horses there and things. But for a lot of years, you go up there, and there'll be six or eight horses here at Washington Terry Stevens. A few horses. And uh, I used to watch them. A couple times I thought, that is one smart son of a gun right there. He never, like he was saying, he set yourself up for success or failure, and I seen him do some things that I thought that's smart. I'd sit there and watch him. He was always, typically, starts shirt, starts pants. And I'm not just saying this because he's here, but everything he done was, if you're around him, it'll be around, anybody that's been around him, you'll find that he's a little bit too anal. <laughs> That's but he's true. angle about everything, but I've learned shooting show horses that it's that's what makes the uh, and Craig Harrison there will tell you too, and anybody that's around him, but he shoots up, up those shows, shoots a lot of them horses, and they come to them and they got problems and they got to fix them before the next class. But it's funny how sometimes all it is is a matter of the horse you watch it turn on the asphalt because that's where they're at a lot. They'll give. And all it is sometimes on some of them horses because they've been used a lot, like this horse here, been rode a lot, is a matter of rasping the nail heads off to where they ain't sticking down any at all. So when they turn on that concrete, their foot can twist on the, on the asphalt. Sometimes that's all it is. Sometimes it's just a swipe or two with the rasp. As Terry used to tell me it's the millimeters. Um, well, I look at it like this. This has kind of been my deal. I, uh, my father was a very... Uh, if I swept the garage floor or the barn floor or whatever the case might be and I left something, I didn't go over there and clean up one part of it, the old man made me sweep the whole thing all over again. Finally, I learned that uh, I had to get smarter out fox him or I was going to turn around and, you know, get a thrash or whatever the case might be. But, I went in the uh, Air Force in uh, 1963, went through the uh, Vietnam era, did uh, three tours of Southeast Asia. I was qualified on B-52s, uh, KC-135 refuel aircraft, and uh, B-47, which they phased out when I was in the service. Uh, there was still a few of them, like two or three at the time. But anyway, every time you did airplane inspections, you had to go ahead and cover your bases with a, uh, with a stamp that said, hey, you said this was okay. I got out of the service and I saved a lot of money, had a bad attitude because I did, uh, went through uh, the Vietnam deal over there and whatnot, came back and, and uh, pretty much just shot all my money that I saved, which was a lot of money for that time. Christ, I probably could have bought a couple of houses. You buy a house back then for $2,500. And uh, pretty much went through all my money, went to my dad and wanted to borrow some money, so what you do with all the money you had? Well, I've spent it. He said, well, I ain't gonna give you no money. You're not responsible enough to have money. So anyway, a friend of mine that just graduated from computer school, him and I had hunted and fished and just pretty much stayed drunk and raised hell for about from September to the, the end of December. And uh, he called me up one day and he says, hey, he says, uh, there's some people downtown that are hiring for an outfit by the name of Pratt Whitney. Well, I knew what Pratt Whitney was. They made jet airplane, airplane engines. So anyway, he says, you want to go down there? Eh, I don't know. I don't want to go down there. And then he says, well, I'm going to go down there. He says, they're looking for computer specialists. And hell, at that time, I didn't even hardly know what a computer was. and still don't. And uh, so I go down there, go in there. Guy says, you're hired. He says, uh, when can you show up? I said, I'm ready right now. He says, we'll pay you $900 uh, per diem fee. And that was out there in uh, Hartford, Connecticut. That's how I ended up in Connecticut. And uh, I thought, man, I'm going to be rich in no time at all. The guy giving me money to just go on out there. Well, little did I know, I left out of there with about uh, $70 in my pocket. You know, the motel out then was about uh, $19, $17, $19 a night. Well, didn't take long for where I was pretty short. When I went up there and got hired in, they said, uh, you're going to be two weeks before you get that money. <laughs> I got to eat and live 
and all that stuff, I had a, I had a big change coming. So anyway, they, they hired me for a quality control inspector, but I couldn't stand to be inside. So that's what, and I was riding horses with the public and showed quarter horses and all that. And went ahead, walked up to my boss one day, and they'd already got me on first shift. I started on the second shift and got up there in front of my boss. He says, uh, what do you need? I said, well, I need to, I'd like to see what merit I want to leave in first because you had to go through the chain of command and give him my notice. He said, what do you mean you notice? I said, well, I'm going to terminate. He said, terminate? What are you going to do? I said, I'm going to go to show the horses. <laughs> he said, yeah, you better go up and see the big boss. So I go up there and whip Merritt, he's sitting in this big desk. And one thing, I always smoke a cigar about that big round, kind of a stood about here on me in a real stock and I uh, walked in there and he says, Steve, what can I do for you? I said, well, I said, I just want to give you my notice. He said, notice? He said, what do you want, a vacation? He said, you only been here a year and a half. I said to him, I said, no. I said, I want to give you my notice. Said, quit. Quit. He says, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to go to be a horse show. He looked at me. Dad stuck that little cigar in his mouth and had a couple of puffs going. He walked up and got about this far from my nose. He said, young man, he said, I'm going to tell you something. Horses are out and airplanes are in. <laughs> he said, I want you to go down to the turbine section. There's a fellow down there by the name of Perry Gibhart, whom I knew Perry Gibhart. He was kind of a backyard horseshoer. And uh, used to see him at the open horse shows and that kind of stuff. He said, you go down and check with Perry Gibbard. He's been working here at Pratt Witch and he couldn't make it at the horseshoe. I never bothered with that. Anyway, I left there, went to horseshoe school, never looked back. One of the things that I was going to show you, I, I told you I always put the smooth leather part to the horse's foot. And when I do that, I use one number six to go ahead and take care of two shoes. Most guys will go ahead and they'll use a, a one pad and put it on like that and there's a whole lot of waste. So I, uh, I go ahead and I drill my uh, holes in my shoe first here and here. And then after I've got that done, I put them on top of my pad and do two shoes like that. And then I cut them out with the bandsaw. And the bandsaw I use, I put a, uh, a uh, eight inch uh, blade on that and you can, you can about cut figure eights with that because it's real, real thin, real small. Just a little tip, might help you, might not. And I also go ahead and use uh, smooth galvanized roofing nails because I find they're a whole lot cheaper than, uh, than uh, copper nails. Maybe a little harder to go ahead and take out if you got to replace the pad. We all set. Huh? Oh, we'll talk. <laughs> we got a, uh, let's uh, punch it, uh, push that drill, drill all over the place. Yeah. How much time we got? Eight yeah. You got Mark. You're good. Mark will nail them on it in a minute and a half. He does it all the time. Contest. Probably not. Should be. Probably not. Should be. 
We normally do this with a drill press. And things are a little bit easier with that. They're sharp.
back. Just go right through them all. When you do that, you can see the amount of waste I end up with. Now, normally when I do these, I have a grinder set up, I run around that edge of the grinder. First I go ahead and go down through here and I double this right here on the grinder. I go here, here, and up here. And when you double this right in here, back about that far, what that does, when that horse goes ahead and comes to the ground, He'll fill that with dirt. And when that stays with dirt, that pad will never move. Between the three nails that you'll have up here and these two, two nails back in here, your pad will be tight and that, that pad will grab that foot just like that. Nail her up.
lot of times on these uh, horses that you use aluminum shoes with too, you've got a lot of adjustment in the shoe to where you can go ahead and take it, change the brake over a little bit. You can go ahead and knock, roll the edges off if the horse is a little bit sticky on the ground or you see him walking, he's a little bit sticky. You can knock those edges real off real easy when that's on the foot and it makes things go along a lot more comfortable for him. Do you ever reset them much? No. Very seldom. Very seldom. After that, man. One of the things that I do, and it's just kind of me, after I put two nails in the foot, because I've gone ahead and used the pad, I'll go to my uh, uh, hoof stand and dress my foot down. That way if I got a heel that's maybe moved in a little bit and I don't see it that good, I'm getting old, my eyes, so on and so forth. If I got, I can just bang that shoe left or right, medial or, or uh, lateral. I can go ahead and drive it forward, I can bring it back. If I got it sitting too far back on the foot, I can move it forward, I can go ahead and bring it back. Whatever it needs to do, and I just do that that way when I nail the rest of my feet. But if I got most of my feet where they always need to be, I don't have to do that. One of the reasons that Mark is helping out with this is uh, I, uh, for 50 years of shoeing horses, I'm dealing with the situation that uh, I've got a real bad hip. My left hip, and I'm sure you probably know so I've kind of about half the hip around it. And my uh, hips gives me a lot of trouble. I need to have them replaced, but right now I'm going through I uh, kind of inherited uh, Lee Lyle's position down there as, as the uh, museum director and moving that and everything else. I just got too much of that stuff on my plate right now to get it done. Give me a look at that one, Terry. Too bad. Too huh? bad. Yeah. If we lay a straight line down through the central sulcus of that frog right now to the point of that toe, you can see that uh, that shoe really sits on there pretty. And we've got equal distances medially and laterally from the outside of that shoe, which really puts that horse into a pretty nice balance compared to what he had before.
one of the things that I do, and Mark is pretty much right on the money with it also, when I drive my nails, I don't ever drive my nails all the way to the bottom of my shoe. I leave probably approximately that much up there, so when I go ahead and block my nails, my nail goes to my block and then turns over. Instead of my nails already being tight to the bottom and the only thing they can do is, is pull football down. That way you'll create real pretty clinches in your clinches, especially with these smaller nails where you're using a smaller nail. You can, you can pull them things back off and you won't have nothing but the hole that they sat in. We set these shoes back just a little bit on these uh, on these feet because we had a foot that was sitting here like that. So we went ahead and moved the shoe back to where our breakover is not going to go ahead and get tearing on those uh, lamini like they were when he was barefoot. Next time you come back to this horse after he's grown some foot, you'll be able to set that shoe and that foot. Everything will fit together real nice and come out real pretty. <laughs> Mark just lays those clinches in there. He doesn't go ahead and pull those clinches down. Nice job. What's the juice you're using, Mark? Uh, just, just, just hoof pressing on the end of the sponge. Tricky engine. Now you see there wasn't a whole lot of foot to change on there, all it was it just pretty much put the symmetry to that foot. Maybe bringing the heels down a little bit, but in reality... <laughs> oh, no, no. Yeah, I know. I heard you. <laughs> you know, you've got one that's a little bit long, but it had a bad hole. You know, he's got an apprentice that does this, so he gets a little rusty at it. <laughs> been so long since he's been an apprentice, he's done. But he'll fix it. He just had to bring attention to it.
I don't know if you're all uh, aware of it, but Mark's won some of the biggest contests uh, in North America and Europe, and uh, has gone ahead and uh, his team has gone ahead and won the uh, the classic, the World Championship Classic at at, uh, at uh, Kentucky twice, and uh, been second once. He's uh, is mostly you know he's quite an artist. Any questions? Who wants to shoe the hind feet? Oh, we got that. Oh, we yeah, already got that covered. Got it right over there. Walk it down that road. Thanks. I'm having all I can do to stand up this time. Thanks, Gary. Thank you, sir.